This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 814, recorded on October 7th, 2021. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from New York, Daniel Griffin. Hello, everyone. How's everything, Daniel? Um, you know, it, it's uh, it, it's actually all right. Um, you know, right here in the immediate area. Um, actually, if you look around the country, right, things are things are on the way down. Actually, if you look around the world, um, there, there's these sort of interesting cycles where things shoot up and then it goes down, and and we'll see where we go. But uh, yeah, at at the moment, particularly in the immediate area. But I was on a call earlier today. Actually, Shane Crotty was on the call. Um, it's it's funny because like when things come up, you know, it, people may think I, I know a lot, but I always I'm like, and can I can I call in a friend, Shane? Can I call on you? Hmm. <laughs> so uh, yeah, but in parts of the country, uh, some of my colleagues on the call, it not not so great, right? There's a lot of parts of our country where hospitals are still overflowing, um, where um, you know people just not even COVID, just normal medical issues, they they can't be seen. Um, they're waiting. It's delaying care. Um, yeah, so we, we no by no means are we uh, through this storm. Yeah, we have an email about that sort of situation in a certain part of the country today. Yeah, certain parts of the country, not so great. Well, let me start with my quotation, and then um, I'm going to actually share what, what I think is an entertaining story, which has a certain, uh, well, has a certain reason for sharing it. Uh, so the quotation, there are in fact two things, science and opinion. The former begets knowledge, the latter ignorance. Um, and this is by Hippocrates. I just think this is very uh, telling. I, I'm always a little disappointed when some of my colleagues seem to be sort of searching for confirmation bias to support their opinion and not really just trying to move forward and, and learn. Um, hopefully, I, I'm trying to keep my opinions to a minimum and, and share, share the science um, so that people can form their own opinions based upon that science. Um, sort of an interesting story I, I think I'll share. And and these are dark times in many parts of the country, but this was a story that actually, it was the first time I laughed at work in, well, it's been quite a while. Um, but it was a, a friend, colleague of mine, um, who was telling me a story. He's he's embraced um, monoclonals, He's even though he's a cardiologist. Um, and he's like, uh, Dad, I, I sent this guy for monoclonals. You know, and I was all excited that we got that done. But then he left an off he left a message at the office. He, he went for the monoclonals. He's doing great now, but, but he almost died. And it's like, well, oh my gosh, what, what happened? You know, it's surprising because these monoclonals are so safe. What, what happened? Well, apparently this gentleman went for the monoclonals during um, one of these massive rainstorms that we had. Um, and one of the things we do, right, we send people like during that first week, they're feverish, they're sick, and they've got to get into a car and either go to a tent or in this case, go to an emergency room, get checked in, be there for a number of hours, get the infusion, which he went ahead and, and did. But as he was leaving, it was a torrential um, downpour. And so this feverish guy gets in his car and drives into an area of such degree of flooding that it's actually up to the window level and, and his car completely mm. stalls. He has to actually smash out the window wow. and then climb out the window and swim to where it's shallow enough. Um, and then the, the first person who offers to help him, he lets them know he has COVID and they drive away. The police <laughs> then come and they uh, they offer to drive him home until he informs them that he has COVID. A little bit of a pause. They call his wife, who then picks him up and <laughs> takes him home. Um, so <laughs> this was his uh, this was his harrowing monoclonal infusion experience. But then, as he uh, called my colleague, uh, Dr. Sevilla said, "You know, the next evening he felt." like a hundred percent. He felt great despite having <laughs> COVID, despite having to uh, swim through these uh, freezing waters. So good story. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It's a very, very entertaining story. Um, but yeah, this is one of those reasons why it would be nice to be uh, doing these in the home, bringing the therapies to these yeah. individuals, making it a little, little more accessible. All right. Uh, so some important uh, updates, important dates for people to put on their calendar. They're on my calendar. Um, October 14th will be a discussion of the Moderna booster. Um, 
<clears throat> interesting enough, as I found out from my in-laws, everyone's already getting their Moderna booster, so I don't know what they're talking about. Um, <laughs> apparently, um, you know, boosters for all. Um, so, but this will be specifically Moderna is um, requesting a specific Moderna third dose, which would be half the dose of the first two. Uh, so we'll hear what the FDA um, independent advisory panel has to say on that. Um, the next day, October 15th, J&J &J is going to be um, uh, having the FDA independent advisory committee discuss a booster for them. And I, and I think we talked about the data there, which is um, actually, I, I would say, rather compelling getting that uh, protection um, for severe disease, hospitalization, um, up into the 90s, kind of at mRNA level, if you give that second dose. So that will be um, interesting to hear, but we're sort of getting positive signals on a J&J &J, um, one and you're not done. I guess you need a second now. Um, and also the heterologous boosting, the mix and match. Uh, what if you had one vaccine? Can you get um, another? A lot of people saying, boy, I got the Pfizer. Can I just get the Moderna as my third dose? Um, my mother, actually, she I was talking to my dad last night. So, oh, yeah, your mother, she's already signed up for her third dose. She She's going to get a Moderna. I'm like, what? And so I talked to my mother. She says, yeah, they called me back. I had two Pfizers and uh, I want to get a Moderna. And they told me I can't do that. Um, so we will find out uh, what happens on the 15th. She's still she's going to wait a little bit longer to get a little more uh, data before she and I make that decision. Um, and then October 26th, for a lot of people, um, Pfizer vaccine uh, for kids, 5 to 11. And, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the fact that this is going to be packaged differently, a different dose, actually even a different um, amount will be injected. Um, but we'll get to that as well. All right. So let us start off with children, COVID. Children are at risk for COVID. Um, I think that's now clear. And as I like to say, wearing a mask is less traumatic for a child than being hospitalized. Um, and we keep hearing about numbers in children, but as numbers go down across the country, um, we had been up to this quarter million um, number for children that's dropping below 200,000. So sort of moving in the right direction there per week. Um, hospitalizations getting a little bit of improvement, but again, this is regional where we're seeing problems. Um, but one of the things I wanted to talk about is I'll say success and maybe when there wasn't success with getting children back out there for in-person activity. So we, we have some data now on how did we do this summer in places where um, there was good guidance, vaccination, masking, et cetera, mitigation measures versus where there wasn't. So couple, we're going to talk about a couple MMWR early releases. The first is multi-component strategies to prevent SARS-CoV-2 transmission, nine overnight youth summer camps, United States, June through August 2021. Um, so as mentioned, this came out as an MMWR early release, and the authors reported on a total of 7,000 173 campers and staff that attended nine U.S. overnight camps that implemented multiple prevention strategies, including high vaccination coverage that was greater than 93 percent among eligible persons, um, pre-arrival and frequent screening testing. There was a total of 38,059 tests um, and additional prevention measures uh, during this time period. There were only nine laboratory confirmed COVID-19 cases and no secondary infections detected during this period. So um, as I like to say, we, we can do this safely. Um, on the other side of the coin, we can also um, mess this up. Um, COVID-19 outbreaks at youth summer camps, Louisiana, uh, June through July 2021, came out also as an MMWR early release. Um, and here the authors were describing 28 camp outbreaks. Um, there was a 31-fold increase in confirmed camp-associated cases compared with the previous summer. Um, and the authors comment that this period coincided with underutilization of preventive measures, such as the vaccines, the masking, the physical distancing. So um, you remove those um, mitigation measures and um, you, you can do this poorly. All right. Well, with the expansion, the, the impending, we hope, expansion of COVID vaccines um, down to the five and 11 year old, um, there's been a lot of discussions about trying to normalize the COVID vaccines, uh, trying to get them into pediatrician offices, because a lot of parents want to have that discussion with the pediatricians, not go to one of these mass vaccination sites. Actually, this is coming up a lot. A lot of individuals 
don't really feel that comfortable going to one of these large sites with the the security presence. Um, maybe I have a little bit of this bias. Um, you know, if, if we're lost, my wife will go ask a police officer. I will, if I see a police officer, maybe go the other direction. Uh, maybe this is my upbringing. Um, you know, I always joke with the police officers when I see them. My last name is Griffin, and, and we try to calculate how many Griffins were in the front seat as police officers and how many of us were in the back seat causing trouble. Um, but this vaccine, we are hoping, um, a lot of parents are hoping they will be able to access in the pediatrician's office. So just a little bit about um, what, what are we expecting on the horizon. So um, the current Pfizer vaccine um, that we've been giving out has a purple cap, um, but we are hearing that the new caps for the children will be orange caps. These are going to be different vials. Um, they're going to be 10 dose vials instead of the five slash six that we were doing before. Um, it's going to be a different amount to dilution. This is going to be a 1.3 ml uh, dilution. Um, the injection rather than 0 0.3 is going to be a 0 0.2 injection. Um, these can sit in the ultra cold freezer for six months, but you can put them in the refrigerator undiluted for 10 weeks, right? That's two and a half months. So that's going to be a great way of getting these in pediatrician's offices, getting those sitting there in the refrigerator. Um, we all, as I think sort of embarrassingly say, we have a lot of vaccines. We expect to have a lot of these. So we're, we're not going to be, we're not expecting people to be quite as stringent with the like, don't waste a dose. It's going to be more of a don't miss an opportunity to vaccinate. Um, there's also for the over 12, there's going to be a, we hear a new gray topped vial that is already pre-diluted. Um, and this can then sit pre-diluted in a refrigerator for 10 weeks undiluted, or actually, let me see if I've got this right, already diluted can sit for 10 weeks. All right. So pre-exposure transmission testing, another nice paper looking at the impact of vaccination on transmission. Um, and this is really, I think, as we've discussed, the community motivation behind vaccination and the pandemic, rather than just looking at individual risk. So we saw the preprint, the impact of SARS-CoV-2 vaccination on alpha and delta variant transmission. Um, and this study was performed as part of the Public Health Surveillance and NHS Test and Trace Program Quality Assurance. Um, and the authors um, start by providing a little, little bit of background that the pre-Delta, there was evidence that there was some impact. Um, and now they're going ahead and looking at the, the risk going forward. So they, they performed a retrospective observational cohort study of contacts of SARS-CoV-2 infected index cases using contact testing data from England. Um, and in this study, 37.2% um, of the contacts tested were PCR positive. Um, they looked at two doses of the BioNTech Pfizer um, or the CHADOX, that's AstraZeneca, um, in the alpha variant index cases. Um, and the reductions they were seeing, um, the adjusted odds ratio 0.18 versus 0.37, so about 82% reduction, about a 63% reduction. Um, but then when they looked at the Delta variant, um, the odds ratio was 0.35 and 0.64. So about a 65% reduction, about a 36% reduction, so not working quite as well. Um, there was an interesting comment, um, and, I, and I think that this is important and maybe plays into as people think about boosters. Um, transmission reductions declined over time, um, since the second vaccination um, for Delta reaching similar levels to unvaccinated by 12 weeks for Chadox and attenuating substantially for BioNTech 162B2, the Pfizer BioNTech. So um, protection from vaccination and contacts um, declined in the three months after second vaccination. So sort of this challenge, our vaccines are really great um, at preventing hospitalizations and um, severe disease, but how long are we gonna get this impact on infection? How long are we gonna get this impact on transmission reductions? Um, I've also been getting several questions about um, <clears throat> a couple AstraZeneca products. Um, the first one is the, um, the, the MABs that they have, and these are these uh, long acting um, antibody therapies. So, um, AstraZeneca's AZD7442, 
very catchy. Request for emergency use authorization for COVID-19 prophylaxis was filed in the US. So these are long acting monoclonals for prevention. And so this request was, was based mainly on data from the PROVENT trial, P-R-O-V-E-N-T trial, where 5,197 participants in a two to one randomization received this AZD7442, which has two MABs in there, and I am not going to go into which they are because this has become a pronunciation challenge, um, and they compared this to placebo, and the primary analysis was based um, on 5,172 participants who did not have SARS-CoV-2 infection in baseline. Um, in this trial, 77% reduction in developing symptomatic COVID compared to placebo. Um, so what's what's special here, right? And we've already talked about how Regen Cove can be used um, in the EUA as, and we will go through the details on that as a prophylactic. Um, but here, this can be given IV or IM, right, as opposed to sub Q. It's a little nicer to give this IM. Uh, this was actually gluteal, so this was given in the tail. Um, there's also a longer half life here. So these antibodies were optimized um, to have an extended half life reduced FC receptor and complement C1Q binding. Um, and so they are actually suggesting that this can afford up to 12 months of protection following a single administration. Um, so a lot of questions I'm getting from my colleagues who take care of um, individuals who are, are immune suppressed. Um, we'll say cancer patients, patients with autoimmune disease, patients on immunosuppressive medications, patients that we do not think are going to get the protection that we would like from vaccinations or maybe even have a contraindication to vaccination. Um, this is potentially a way of providing passive protection. Little exciting news on the testing front, right? We've uh, we've sort of gone full circle, and there's been a lot of folks embracing and really seeing the power the power of the rapid tests, um, but also the at home rapid tests. So on the fourth of October, the U.S. FDA issued another EUA for the Acon Laboratories FlowFlex COVID nineteen home test. Um, Per the manufacturer, they are planning and they claim they have the capacity to produce more than 100 million tests per month. They think they'll be able to ramp this up to 200 million per month by February 2022. So very exciting um, because right now, as we know, everyone's excited about home tests, but no one can get them. Um, I even tried to do this myself. They are in short supply. Um, and also, if you want to understand how to use these, because right, you're going to be swabbing yourself um, the same day the CDC updated their COVID um, self-testing page where you can see some really nice um, infographics about how to stick that Q-tip up your nose and, and get these samples. I presume this is an antigen test, Daniel? Yes. Yeah, and these, you, um, uh, is it going to be less than a dollar? <laughs> <laughs> let's see if I have the if let's see if I have the money. Um, let's see if I have the cost here. Um, I do not know what the cost is going to be, but will it be less than a dollar? The answer is no. <laughs> will it be maybe five dollars? Uh, maybe, maybe. Um, there is the the potential um, that the U.S. government will purchase a lot of these and then distribute them. So. Um, that could be, uh, well, not quite free because we're paying our taxes. All right, active vaccination. Um, you know, vaccines, the jabs that keep you from getting sick. And I like to say vaccination is how this pandemic ends. I'm talking about those first doses. That's where we get our bang for our buck. Um, in the New England Journal, we saw the peer-reviewed publication, Phase 3, Safety and Efficacy of the CHADOX-1 COVID-19 Vaccine. Um, and these are the... Uh, Finally, we're getting the peer-reviewed publication of the ongoing um, results from the ongoing double-blind randomized placebo-controlled phase three clinical trial looking at the safety, vaccine efficacy, and immunogenicity of two doses of the AstraZeneca CHADOX as compared with placebo in preventing, it's always important, what are we looking at, the onset of symptomatic and severe COVID disease 2019 15 days or more after the second dose in adults, including older adults in the United States, Chile, and Peru. Um, in this trial, 
a total of 32,451 participants underwent randomization in a two to one ratio to receive this vaccine um, or placebo. So we had 21,635 versus placebo, 10,816. And the overall vaccine efficacy for preventing symptomatic and severe was 74%. Um, interesting enough, the estimated vaccine efficacy for this endpoint was 83.5% in participants 65 years of age or older. Um, they report that this high vaccine efficacy was consistent across a range of demographic subgroups. Um, in the fully vaccinated analysis subgroup, they reported no severe or critical symptomatic COVID-19 cases. Um, so that, that's, you know, you got to think about our endpoints. So that's a pretty um, excellent endpoint for looking at severe or critical disease, 83.5 for symptomatic. So uh, pretty, pretty impressive data here. Um, on October 4th in The Lancet, we saw another article, again, on vaccines, effectiveness of mRNA BNT162B2, Pfizer-BioNTech, COVID-19 vaccine up to six months in a large integrated health system in the U.S., a retrospective cohort study. So this is a peer-reviewed article. This is a retrospective cohort study where they analyzed electronic health records of individuals who are members of Kaiser Permanente, South California. Um, they were looking at the effectiveness against infections and COVID-19 related hospital admissions for up to six months. So this is a this is a very robust data set, right, by an organization that um, I'll say does an excellent job. Um, Four million nine hundred twenty thousand five hundred forty nine individuals were assessed for eligibility, and ultimately three million four hundred thirty six. 9,957 were included. So for fully vaccinated infections, they report, fully vaccinated individuals, they report that effectiveness against infections declined from 88% during the first month to 47%. So that's effectiveness against infection. Um, so among sequenced infections, vaccine efficacy, effectiveness against infections of the Delta variant was high during the first month. 93%, and that went to 53% after four months. Um, effectiveness against other variants the first month, 97%, 67% at four to five months. But what about vaccine effectiveness against hospital admissions for infections with the Delta variant? 93% up to six months. Um, so I take away this as very encouraging. Um, I know Pfizer vaccine has been getting a lot of bad press, um, you know, People are a little upset that they get the Pfizer instead of Moderna, but vaccine effectiveness against severe disease, right? Hospital admissions with the Delta variant, 93% for up to six months. So I found this rather encouraging. What about reinfection? I get a lot of questions about this. Um, and so there, there, there's a lot of articles out there, but this article, The Durability of Immunity Against Reinfection by SARS-CoV-2, a comparative evolutionary study was published in The Lancet Microbe. Um, so we certainly see reinfections, mainly starting about three months after infection and increasing over time. Um, we know that if these folks get vaccinated, um, they can decrease their risk of infection um, by at least twofold. Um, we're not sure one dose got us there, but two dose two doses did in the MMWR publication we talked about. So if prior infection, we know that these individuals can get a benefit from vaccination. Um, in this study, the authors looked at antibody data for six human infecting coronaviruses, um, extending from 128 days to 28 years after infection. This is a pretty um, broad um, study, infection between 1984 and 2020. Um, they used this data to estimate profiles of the typical antibody decline and probabilities of reinfection over time under endemic conditions. Um, they estimated that reinfection by SARS-CoV-2 under endemic conditions um, would likely occur between three months out to 5.1 years um, after the peak in the antibody response, um, suggesting a median of about 16 months. 
um, they calculated that this protection is is less than half the duration revealed for the other endemic um, circulating coronaviruses. So OC43, NL63, 229E, if people um, have those remembered. But what I'm going to say for a deeper dive into the comparison between protection from infection versus vaccination, I'm going to recommend people go to TWIV 813, um, discussion with Florian uh, Kramer. Um, you know, it's really a really a popular um, popular topic that people are trying to sort out. But just to make it clear, we recommend that people who have been previously infected um, get the benefit of vaccination. All right. A popular question now, I don't know if, uh, Vincent, if you are aware of this, but I keep getting, am I still considered fully vaccinated if I haven't had my booster? Um, and straight from the CDC, yes, everyone is considered fully vaccinated two weeks after their second COVID vaccine in a two-shot series or two weeks after a single-dose vaccine uh, for the J&J &J Janssen for those folks here in the U.S. So I, I've been getting a lot of employers, um, interesting enough, who are now demanding that their um, that their employees get a third dose. Otherwise, they're not considered fully vaccinated. But straight from the CDC, you know, this is evolving. But at the moment, um, you're still good. I know we're up to 400,000 people getting a booster per day here in the U.S. So, uh, yeah. Anyway. All right. Um, passive vaccination. I want to remind people, remember monoclonals after high-risk exposures and high-risk people. We talked a little bit about um, AstraZeneca is applying for this, but we already have post-exposure prophylaxis as part of the EUA for Regen Cove. Um, and, and who are the people that they are recommending um, eligible for post-exposure prophylaxis? These are individuals who are at high risk for progression to severe COVID-19, um, including hospitalization or death. These are folks who are either not fully vaccinated or are not expected to mount an adequate immune response um, to the SARS-CoV-2 vaccination, right? So individuals with immunocompromising conditions, those on immunosuppressive medicines. Um, so you're looking at individuals who have been exposed. Um, but I also want to point out, they also talk about for individuals in whom repeat dosing um, is considered because they continue to have ongoing exposure. Um, so just a little bit of subtlety there. Um, an individual who is immunosuppressed, who is not getting that protection from vaccine, but continues to be um, exposed over and over. Um, the first dose is the 600-600, but you can actually continue to dose them every four weeks um, with a 300 milligram 300 milligram, um, and that can either be by subcutaneous injection. So in this sense, you only have to get two instead of four shots, or they can get an intravenous infusion every four weeks. Um, for, what, for a while, we were stepping back a little on prophylaxis because of shortages, but as the numbers are going down, as we're getting improved access, um, we're stretching back out with the post-exposure prophylaxis. All right, the period of detectable viral replication, not the time for antibiotics and not the time for steroids. We can do harm there. Um, this is for a lot of people exciting, the beginning of a new era. Merck and Ridgeback announced the planned interim analysis results from the phase three move out trial, looking at the use of the oral antiviral. This is a pill, malnupiravir, in the early treatment of at-risk non-hospitalized adult patients with mild to moderate COVID-19. Um, so this was a planned interim analysis. They evaluated data from 775 patients who were initially enrolled um, in the trial, the phase three move out trial. Um, and at the time of the decision to stop recruiting, um, the trial was approaching full recruitment a uh, sample size of 1,550 patients with more than 90% of the intended sample size already enrolled. Um, when they perform this interim analysis, and I want to point out this is top line data. This is not peer reviewed. We don't have the details that will be coming forward. They reported in this study that malnupiravir reduced the risk of hospitalization or death by approximately 50%. Um, so we had 7.3% versus 14.1%. Um, the little bit of sort of details here, in the individuals that received the antiviral, there were zero deaths. In the placebo group, there were eight deaths. So we're looking at zero versus 2%. So 2%, the expected mortality, 0% in the folks that got um, this therapy. Um, what about eligibility and timing? 
These individuals had to have laboratory confirmed COVID-19 with symptom onset within five days of study randomization, right? So a little bit longer than, than we would ideally want, right? Because you get randomized at day five, may take you another day before you actually get the therapy. All the patients had to have at least one risk factor associated with poor disease outcome, right? So this is a slightly higher risk um, group. Um, people did well, very well tolerated therapy. Um, there, is a, there is a recommendation to go ahead and look at possibly getting EUA. So we will find um, as we go forward. But just a little background, right, because this is going to be one of the first drugs here that um, is being introduced. Um, this is a RNA dependent RNA polymerase inhibitor, right? That's something that we, we mammals don't um, have to worry about. Um, there is going to be discussion about the safety of this drug. That's why it's going to go through the FDA. Um, but this is really the first in this class um, going forward. Um, we expect there to be another very similar drug. Um, and we also expect um, another drug that we've talked about that's going to target the protease um, on the horizon. So fingers crossed, we're looking about three oral drugs being available by December. But I was going to, I was going to, Vincent, do you want to make any comments at this point? I sort of thought this was an exciting bit of news. I think it's great that we, we, these are in development. My only concern, and I'm sure as a physician who treats AIDS patients, Daniel, these will be initially used as monotherapy. And I'm just concerned that we're going to get rapid resistance, which will render them less useful. What do you think? Yeah, so I, I hopefully we've learned from the HIV, um, and, I th and we've also learned from influenza, right, mm -hmm. um, is that if you use these drugs all by themselves, you run a risk, particularly if they're used widely, which we're thinking they will be, of inducing resistance. So um, I've already talked about the concept of maybe using this with maybe the protease inhibitor. Maybe if mm -hmm. we can use two drugs, we can put up a, a barrier to that resistance. So, no, I think I think that's key. Anytime we use a drug, um, we we can end up with resistance. So it may be that we want to look at using two drugs so that we're not pressuring and driving that. Um, I worry particularly if people use this more than just as a five-day therapy, what mm -hmm. if you have a person who's immunosuppressed and you start using it for a longer period of time? But don't you have to trial them in, in combinations to get them approved that way? Yeah, we're going to have to do that. <laughs> <laughs> and and it, this will be two drug, you know, different drug companies, three yeah. drug companies, all like, you know, playing nicely, working together. But it is interesting with, with HIV, we're, we're often using, um, you know, three drug therapy. That's kind of the mm -hmm. triple highly effective mm -hmm. antiretroviral therapy um, where, um, you know, often historically it was three different companies were producing each of the different drugs in the cocktail. All right. Um, timing, you know, so we've got exciting stuff because the IDSA meeting was just recently. Um, and so this was data that was presented there and it was risk factor analysis for hospital admission following severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus 2, SARS-CoV-2, monoclonal antibody treatment. Um, and this was really looking at timing. If we get those monoclonals in earlier, does that um, give us better bang for our buck. So we look at this whole like less, you know, seven to 10 days after symptom onset, 70 to 80% reduction. But are we going to get even more reduction if we get them in the first few days? So here they're looking at patients that received what they say is early. So within days one through five of symptom onset and comparing those to people who received them late, six to 12. Um, and so here we were seeing getting the MAB infusion in the first five days resulted in a 54% reduction in progression um, relative to those folks um, that get them late. So with the monoclonals, timing matters. I know a lot of centers closed down over the weekend. Um, bit of a tragedy, right? Person gets diagnosed on a Friday evening and they can't get treated until um, Monday or Tuesday, right? Um, so we really need to focus on timing here. Um, of the patients that received the monoclonals in days one through three, none, zero experienced disease progression. So sooner is better. We're hoping this translates in the oral antiretrovirals, antivirals as well. See my antiretroviral slip, my world of <laughs> HIV is coming back. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we're really hoping sooner can make more of a difference than later. Um, all right, everybody, MISC, 
Miss C and Miss A, remember those? Multi um, system inflammatory um, syndrome. So we, we have actually um, finally got a little bit of guidance on treatment coming out in a publication of peer reviewed article, IVIG compared to IVIG plus infliximab in multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. Uh, this was published in Pediatrics, the official journal of the American Academy of Pediatrics. This was a retrospective cohort study of 72 patients with Miss C, um, and they're looking at IVIG alone versus IVIG plus infliximab, right? So this is going to neutralize the TNF alpha. Um, basically, what I'm going to just nutshell this here, they were looking at better outcomes in the children that got Remicade, the infliximab added to their IVIG. Um, they reported that patients with Miss C um, compared to those with IVIG alone were less likely to require any additional therapy, decreased ICU length of stay, decreased development of left ventricular cardiac dysfunction, more rapid decline in their C-reactive protein, so following inflammatory markers. All right, a couple exciting things here on long COVID. I feel like I'm going a little long today. Um, COVID is not just a two-week viral illness for many people. First, as of October 1st, we now have an official code for post-acute sequelae of COVID-19. This is U09.9, post-COVID-19 condition unspecified. Um, going forward, we'll have subsets. Um, also, some exciting data on the impact of vaccination on long COVID. The article, Efficacy of COVID-19 Vaccination on the Symptoms of Patients with Long COVID, a target trial emulation using data from the COMPARE, that's a capital P, capital R, e-cohort in France. Uh, this was posted on Lancet as a preprint. So the authors used data from this long COVID cohort um, this was a cohort in France. Vaccinated patients were matched to unvaccinated controls in a one-to-one -one ratio by using their propensity scores. Um, and they looked at outcomes 120 days after baseline. Um, they looked at the B disease severity. So you had 455 patients in the vaccine group, 455 in the control group. And what did they find? They reported that by 120 days, um, vaccination was associated with a reduction in long COVID symptoms. They saw double the rate of patients in complete remission. Um, they saw reduced um, disease impact on patients' lives and the proportion of patients with an unacceptable symptom score. Um, so th this is encouraging. Remember, this is, and we probably will never get a randomized placebo-controlled trial. There's always the, the concern that there was some sort of a placebo effect. Um, also, people got vaccinated, unvaccinated. They're not exactly matched. Um, but this, this is something that is consistent with our clinical experience, um, where we're treating hundreds, thousands of um, folks. And we're seeing this report. Um, Encouraging. But what about Beckettism, right? That's what that's what we scientists care about. We, we do want our patients to get better, but we also like to know what is going on. Um, and just a, we're going to close with a couple articles on um, some insights into mechanisms. The peer-reviewed article, Persistent Clotting Protein Pathology in Long COVID, Post-Acute Sequelae of COVID-19, PASC, um, is accompanied by increased levels of antiplasmin. Now, this was published in the journal Cardiovascular Diabetology. Um, this is not a journal I usually read, and I'm not as familiar with some of the platelet activation studies um, that they did. But basically, going through the suggestion here was that um, hypercoagulability, a persistent hypercoagulability, was being driven by inflammatory molecules, circulating microclots, hyperactivated platelets, issues with the fibrolytic fibrolytic system. Um, and then the speculation here, which requires further study, is that with clotting pathologies involved, maybe some anti-clotting therapies can have an impact on long COVID. So um, hopefully this will give us some, some sense of what to do going forward. COVID toes, right? Remember COVID toes? Um, I have special socks with COVID toes. The article, Type 1 Interferon Response and Vascular Alteration in Chill Blain Like Lesions During the COVID-19 Outbreak, was published in the British Journal of Dermatology. Um, this was an observational study conducted 9 through 16, April 2020, at Saint-Louis Hospital in Paris, France. 50 patients... Um, 
referred with chill brain like lesions were seen during the period of the COVID-19 pandemic included in this study. Um, they were comparing the skin and blood endothelial and immune cell activation in the chilblain-like lesions um, in these COVID folks to seasonal chilblains um, that were cold-induced sporadic chilblains. They reported that they found chilblain-like lesions were characterized in the COVID folks, higher IgA tissue deposition, um, more significant transcriptomic activation of complement and angiogenesis factors. Um, they reported systemic immune response associated with IgA antineutrophil cytoplasmic antibodies in 73% of patients, an elevated type 1 interferon blood signature um, compared to healthy controls. Um, and they, find, they found blood biomarkers, which they reported related to endothelial dysfunction and activation, um, angiogenesis, endothelial pro progenitor cell mobilization, um, really supporting in their analysis a role for endothelial dysfunction in the chilblain like lesions. Um, so very, very interesting. Um, this is something that actually I think a lot of the nurses noticed early on. They're spending a little more time than the physicians looking at the patients, something that was seen in the outpatient setting as well. Um, so just interesting that we're starting to get a little science to maybe help us understand. Um, I like to close by saying no one is safe until everyone is safe. We are going to continue during the months of August, September, and October um, to donations made to Parasites Without Borders doubled and going to support floating doctors with their efforts down in Central America. So drop what you're doing, go to parasiteswithoutborders.com, click on donate and help us continue to do our work and help us to support this organization. Time for some email questions for Daniel. You can send yours to daniel at microbe.tv. Lisa is a nurse practitioner, a pediatric nurse practitioner who writes, I agree kids are at risk. The decision made by adults responsible for protecting them, sadly, too often put them at higher risk than they need to be. While numbers here in Florida are finally beginning to trend down, they remain much too high. We are in the middle of a mask debate with a local chiropractor handing out blank signed medical mask exemptions after a very contentious school board meeting in which our county school board instituted a mask mandate in defiance of our governor's ban on this. Parents continue to show up in front of our schools with signs that making our kid wear masks is child abuse. Parents and children too often refuse to abide by our request that they wear masks in our office. And now our new state surgeon general, who says he is rejecting fear over COVID mania, has decided that as long as they are feeling well, our school children, many of whom, of course, are unable to be vaccinated or if they are able or not, no longer need to quarantine or test simply because they've been exposed to this pesky little virus. I am curious as to your opinion on this brilliant public health policy. Yeah, I'm I'm horrified actually, just to be frank. I mean, there's you know, when you see like the movies, right, there's always like the the physician who can outrank the general. You can't do that because of this health issue and, and somehow in the real world, um there, there's no none of that outranking going on. Um Yes, 18 months ago, there was this myth that started to be spread that children were, were not at risk of COVID. Well, if children don't get COVID, well, they're not at risk of COVID. But now that we saw um, children getting exposed to COVID, we saw hundreds of thousands of children getting infected per week. We saw thousands of children ending up in the hospital. We see children, um, multiple children dying every week. Um, there, there really has to be a certain point when you start off with, no, children are at risk of COVID. Children can die of COVID. Children can get hospitalized with COVID. Children can develop long COVID with long-term disabilities. Um, yes, this this is a um, horrible thing to let happen to our children. And we don't really know what are going to be the long-term effects of having been infected with this horrible virus. The second is we do know things that work, things that reduce our risk. You shouldn't have to choose between education and safety for your children. A child shouldn't have to choose between education and safety. We know how to keep our children safe. Um, wearing a mask is something that parents complain a lot more about than children. Um, a lot of children actually kind of like the masks with the different designs and maybe it's become an accessory. Um, I just really think we have to uh, step back 
and uh, take this out of the political arena. This is not a partisan issue. Um, this is not a political thing. This should not be something that gets you reelected. Um, what should get you reelected and what should get you support um, is protecting our children, helping them get educated safely. And we know how to do that. We keep talking about all the data behind that. Michelle writes, I'm in a quandary trying to decide what the best option for my daughter is. She turns 12 in January. She's 61 inches tall, 150 pounds. So she's the size of a small adult. She attends a school in which masks are only optional. Most kids are not wearing them. My concern is whether to get my daughter vaccinated in late fall with the children's dose or wait until January for the adult dose. Yeah. I mean, this, I have to say, we've, we've talked about this about, this is perfect, right? Is that person right on the line? Um, there's going to be no judgment. It's going to be, this is the day it happens. But you know, this is even true with influenza. I have a colleague who's a hematology oncologist and he was turning, he turned 65 today. So happy birthday, Bruce. Um, and Bruce went to get his um, higher dose because they're still using the egg-based vaccine at the healthcare system. So um, he wanted to get the over 65 high dose because they're not using the cell-based flu vaccine. Um, and they said, I'm sorry, um, you know, it's Friday. Your birthday is not until Thursday. Um, you, you can't get it today. You'll have to come back when you turn 65. Um, so we're, it's interesting. Uh, people are pretty rigid about this stuff. The children all across look to be getting a really robust response with the lower dose. Um, I would say don't don't wait. Don't miss an opportunity to vaccinate. Don't miss an opportunity to give your child that protection. Um, if it turns out in the future, um, you know, boosters are recommended for, um, you know, individuals as we get more um, information about correlates of immunity. Um, but yeah, let's I would encourage you to go ahead. And uh, when your child is eligible, um, go ahead and get the proper dose for that age. Uh, Daniel writes, in New South Wales, Australia at the moment, there are a number of people in ICU and dying after full vaccination. I know this is to be expected, but I feel that discussion of this is avoided and leads my older friends particularly to feel confused and helpless. All the people who have died here post-vaccine have been in their 80s and 90s. They have also all had other underlying issues, but the underlying issues are never reported. My understanding of why this would occur at all is that the individual was unable to mount an immune response to the vaccine, not that the vaccine has weakness, but the individual. Is this correct? Are, these, are there young, healthy people who make no immune response and are protected for some reason? Is there a specific list of age plus underlying conditions that people can look at and clearly understand their level of risk? Um, so, so yes, I, I actually feel like you're right on with this. We, we talked about the vaccines reducing your risk of death by, I'm going to say 30, right? We'll pick that as a number. Um, you know, you hate to pick one study, but that, that seems to be reasonable. So if you went from, you know, your risk, you know, you're 90 years old, you're obese, you have diabetes, you have Down syndrome, right? Let's stack them all together. If your risk was, you know, 60%, that you were going to die if you got COVID, well, that, you know, you take 60 divided by 30, you still have a 2%. You still have a one in 50 chance of dying. Um, my wife and I were talking yesterday, we're out walking the dogs. Uh, and, you know, I was saying, Jessica, when you get, you know, this reduction, so a, you've got your vaccine, you're now at 95% reduction for ending up in hospital. Well, you started off, you're in your 40s, your ideal body weight, you exercise, you have no, you started off with maybe a 1% and now you're down to, you know, 5% of 1%, incredibly low. Um, so this is that, that sort of uh, risk reduction. People think, oh my gosh, 95% reduction. That means 5% of people are going to end up in the hospital. No, you have to take your baseline risk. And this is a reduction below that. So yes, we are going to see a couple people a day here in the US, right? Large country who are vaccinated and still end up dying. But we're going to see thousands who are unvaccinated end up in the hospital and dying. We're also going to see a certain percent of people who are vaccinated end up in the hospital. But that's going to be a 30 full you know, or a tenfold um, reduction in that number. Um, so that's really, you're really hitting right on it. This is a reduction in baseline risk. So yeah, who are going to be those people who still end up in the hospital? It's going to be predominantly older individuals. It could be predominantly individuals with a lot of comorbidities. And those people that do die, um, they're going to be those individuals who have the highest risk factors. And finally, Helen is the parent of a 34-year-old adult with Down. She has had two Pfizer vaccines. 
wondering if there are any data on how well people with Down respond to the vaccines. Daughter is in a day program where everyone's vaccinated, but she's still concerned. Yeah, no, it's, that's an excellent question. And I think you hit on one of the things that I touched on there. Down syndrome is a significant risk factor for hospitalization and death. I think it's about a tenfold. It was a British Medical Journal article in September uh, where they were looking at these. Actually, it's a great article, uh, British Medical Journal. I think it was the 17th of September, the article came out where they were looking at all these different factors. Down syndrome was about a tenfold increased risk of death. So when they talked about populations that they felt were at increased risk when they started talking about the Pfizer booster. Down syndrome was one of those um, thrown in there. Um, so yeah, individuals with all these different comorbidities, particularly Down syndrome, are at increased risk. Um, what about response to the vaccine? Um, I haven't really seen any really good data looking specifically at individuals with the Down syndrome response, but put it in that context of the overall risk. That's COVID-19 clinical update number 83 with Dr. Daniel Griffin. Thank you, Daniel. Oh, thank you. And and be safe. And I, I say that to all those kids who have to go to school without masks. Um, be as safe as you can.